resources are being drained day after day on the streets of Baghdad and Mosul, we're struggling to protect high-risk targets on the streets of our own neighborhoods. We know our police departments are just a phone call away during an emergency. Our brave men and women in law enforcement have dedicated themselves to serving and protecting our communities. So it's unbelievable to me that the Bush administration has reduced or eliminated nearly every major anti-crime program over the course of the last seven years, especially since crime and violence have been on the rise in the country, according to the FBI reports. Crimes going up, violent crimes going up, the Bush administration's cuts to the most essential public safety programs, uh, the very essence of homeland security, uh, go down. What should be going up is going down. What should be going down is going up. How can we expect law enforcement to carry out their responsibilities and respond in a moment's notice when the federal government is backing out of its responsibilities to support law enforcement? People in my home state of New Jersey remember on September 11th that it wasn't the federal government that provided the immediate response. It was the local police and firefighters and emergency management and medical units from our hometowns. Yet in the years after September 11th, the administration has left our local communities to shoulder far too much of the financial burden. Our budget, however, will ensure that first responders across the nation will get the resources they need. And I was proud to work with Chairman Conrad to ensure that Homeland Security grants that our communities rely on most were protected in this budget. The Democratic budget restores more than $2 billion in misguided cuts the President made to state Homeland Security grants port security, interoperable communications, rail, and transit security. Our budget will ensure that states facing threats from high-risk targets or densely populated areas, communities that are near ports, chemical plants, airports, cities with mass transit or rail systems will not be shortchanged. By restoring more than $750 million in cuts to grants to firefighters, we'll also ensure that our fire departments can buy new equipment or ensure that our fire stations are fully staffed. And unlike the President, we will keep our commitment to fulfilling the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission and will keep our commitment to our first responders. And we more than double the funding for the Burn JAG program that many local law enforcement officials across the country, many who have visited me, consider the most successful crime prevention program in recent history. I'm proud to have introduced an amendment that was passed unanimously in the Budget Committee, setting aside a minimum of $520 million to fund it, and I'm going to ensure that we continue to support this vital program. We've also included language to help the FBI cut down its massive backlog in evaluating immigration applications for those who do follow our rules to legally enter the country. Cutting down this backlog is essential if the FBI is going to be able to quickly separate those who have come to pursue the American dream versus those who may have come to destroy it. And our budget puts a priority on making health care more affordable and more accessible to all Americans. We've worked to create a reserve fund to block President Bush's unilateral changes to Medicaid that would severely reduce federal health care funds to states for low-income families. These are, this is the very essence of the social safety net that we as a society should be judged by. The Reserve Fund would also help protect New Jersey's family care program from the President's draconian cuts to children's health coverage scheduled for the summer. We've included support for other legislation, and this budget includes funding for the Patient Navigator Program, which I worked hard to have passed into law. If patients are having trouble figuring out the complicated health care system we are in, if they don't know how to get early screening or don't know about options or follow-up treatment, patient navigators make sure that someone's there to help them. Our budget also keeps our commitment to our schools, our teachers, and our students. And I'm proud that our budget provides the largest increase for elementary and secondary education in six years. Instead of taking money away from our schools while asking them to do more, our budget will fund programs that provide enrichment and opportunity to our students. We don't just say 
education is a priority. We put our money where our values are by providing $3 billion more than the President for No Child Left Behind, and $8.8 .8 billion more than the President for education and training overall. We soundly reject the President's proposal to freeze education funding and eliminate 48 programs in the Department of Education, including education technology, mentoring, reading programs, and vocational education. Instead of pretending that our young people aren't facing severe hardships when it comes to paying for college, our budget makes the needed investments in grants and scholarships for college and allows for an increase in the Pell Grant maximum next year. That's the support our young people deserve. And under this budget, that's the support they're going to get. I've often said, uh, Madam President, uh, that as someone who grew up poor in a tenement uh, in Union City, New Jersey, the first in my family to go to college. That would never have happened, but for the power of the federal government being able to provide me for the opportunities for grants and loans. And that power uh, gave me the educational opportunity and foundation that allows me today to be the junior senator from New Jersey. The reality is, is that that should be a birthright for every young person in our country willing to work hard and give something back to their nation. This budget meets that value. Madam President, uh, let me close by saying our debate over the budget is a debate over the direction of the economy, the fulfillment of our shared values, and the direction of our country. The President and those who support him are offering the same old ideas that got us into this mess in the first place, ideas that have weakened the economy, and hurt the middle class. You know, if you ask for more of the same, it seems to me you get more of the same. And those who are happy with the economy that we are in would be happy with the President's budget. Those who are languishing, and that's the overwhelming majority of American families in this country, under the President's economic policies, the reality is they want to see change. And that change is represented in the Democratic budget. Democrats have a fiscally responsible plan to get our economy moving again and strengthen our national security. The budget we're putting forth cuts taxes for the middle class, creates half a million new jobs here in America, and we do all of this while working towards a balanced budget and paying down debt. It's a plan that puts forth a basic idea about what America should be. This should be a country where anyone willing to work hard can get an education and a job, a country where everyone has access to services that can keep them healthy, a country where a lifetime of hard work guarantees the right to retire with dignity, a country that knows its past and cares about its future. Madam President, let's invest in that future. Let's pass this budget. Let's begin the hard work of making that vision a reality and changing the economic circumstances for families in our country. Uh, that's what this debate this week is all about. That's what the Democratic budget is all about. That's why I'm proud to have voted for it in the committee, proud to stand on the floor to defend it, Plan to, uh, proud to support uh, Senator Conrad uh, in his efforts in this regard. And with that, uh, Madam President, I yield the floor.